Hello, and welcome to the online performance studio's presentation of Vincent van Gogh in words, music, and art. Vincent van Gogh, even the word Vincent, evokes in many of us the quietest, momentary pause. His name alone creates a certain void a small emptiness and a unique feeling tinged with sadness, helplessness, confusion, or even that of collective guilt. We all know something of his story, and that simple name conjures up a tragic figure, a severely misunderstood mastermind, and as history, or perhaps the arts industry itself would have it, Vincent represents the eternal suffering artist, the suicidal, the maniacal, fanatical, demented, self-destructive artist, a crazed man who would go to whatever means necessary to produce his work. More concisely, he was simply an aspiring, unrelenting artist and visionary who sold only one of the many hundreds of paintings created in his lifetime. Very simply, he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He had the highest artistic ideals and led a selfless life of purpose and duty in a profession which, he says, after all, has poetry as its end. Vincent went far beyond the fashionable idea of a bohemian lifestyle. As an artist, he truly walked the walk. As a human being, Vincent van Gogh possessed the deepest sense of and appreciation for humanity and mankind. The only thing I want you not to doubt is my goodwill, he writes. He found the greatest beauty in the smallest moments in our everyday mundane existence. As an artist, he recreated and reinterpreted these very moments through a meticulous technical foundation combined with a pure, untainted, and unadulterated artistic vision. But despite all his accomplishments in art, which seem to us now to be so very profound, beautiful, visionary, groundbreaking, and blatantly obvious, here is a man who was blindly overlooked in his own lifetime, not by his peers and colleagues, but by the people and powers that be within the arts industry, powers who operated as much or more on personal prejudices and inherited biases than on objectivity who were chronically subjective in their judgments to a point where a truly talented artist such as Vincent van Gogh was overlooked entirely, sinking into despair and poverty. Through Vincent's writings, he often mentions the industry's prejudices against him, but it seems that one certain impresario and artist's liaison named H.G. Tiersteeg stood out more so than the several others mentioned. Tiersteeg a man who quite clearly held the reins for Vincent's livelihood and localized career. How did Vincent van Gogh's professional fate fall into nearly one man's dictatorship? How could one man make or break the career of Vincent van Gogh? In today's presentation, we will examine and understand more about this particular arts administrator and of his abusive, prejudicial actions towards Vincent through Vincent van Gogh's actual writings. Although historically labeled a madman by the industry, Vincent was extremely civil, clear, and level-headed in his extensive letter writings. These chronicles leave little doubt that Vincent was indeed driven to madness, striking out against the industry which discriminated against him and against the society which supported it. Today, you will realize that the unscrupulous leg legacy which has been left to Vincent's name is perhaps unjust. For as Mozart had Salieri, and so many great artists have their unchallenged and unaccountable nemesis in the arts business, Van Gogh had Tiersteeg. Vincent often complains and laments about this particular man's personal bias and prejudice towards him, and of his resulting professional dilemma, seemingly incorrigible, in his writings. Throughout our presentation today, we will hear in Vincent's own words the attempts he continually made to reach out to this life and career-giving impresario, 
we will observe how Tiersteeg's personal prejudices translated into sheer blindness as to his abilities to judge Vincent's work objectively, leaving Vincent continually struggling for the basic necessities of his life. So, along with my spare interjections, I speak today for Vincent van Gogh through his own words taken from the hundreds of letters written throughout his life and artistic quest to his younger brother and sole mentor, Theo. Today, I have a new idea in my head, another canvas. This time, it's just simply my bedroom. But color is to do everything, and giving by its simplification of a grander style to things is to be suggestive here of sleep or of rest. In a work, to look at the picture ought to rest the brain, or rather, the imagination. The walls are pale violet, the ground is of red tiles, the wood of the bed and chairs is the yellow of fresh butter, the sheets and pillows greenish lemon, the coverlet scarlet, the window green, the toilet table orange, the basin blue, the doors lilac. The broad lines of the furniture again must express inviolable rest. Portraits on the walls and a mirror and a towel and some clothes. You see how simple the conception is. It is painted in free flat washes like the Japanese prints. No stifling, no hatching, nothing only flat colors in harmony. You will probably think the interior of the empty bedroom with a wooden bedstead and two chairs the most unbeautiful thing of all, and notwithstanding this, I have painted it twice and on a large scale. I want to achieve an effect of simplicity of the sort one finds described in Felix Holt. After being told this, you may quickly understand this picture, but it will probably remain ridiculous in the eyes of others who have not yet been warned. Doing a simple thing, white bright colors, is not at all easy, and I, for my part, think it is perhaps useful to show that it is possible to be simple by using something other than gray, white, black, or brown. Here you have the justification for the study's existence. Yes. I return once again to this interior. I certainly wish that other artists had a taste and a longing for simplicity as I do. But the idealist will not be able to do what wants to get done in the end, as is the case with me.
I have just finished painting to put in my bedroom a memory of the garden at Eton here, and here is a sketch of it. It is a rather large canvas. Here are the details of the colors. The younger of the two ladies who are out for a walk is wearing a Scottish shawl with green and orange checks and a red parasol. 
The old lady has a violet shawl, nearly black, but a bunch of dahlias, some of them citron yellow, the others pink and white mixed, like an explosion of color on the somber figure. Behind them, a few cedar shrubs and emerald green cypresses. Behind the cypresses, one sees a field of pale green and red cabbages, surrounded by a border of little white flowers. The sandy path is of a raw orange color. The foliage of the two beds of scarlet geraniums is very green. Finally, the interjacent plain, there is a maidservant, dressed in blue, who is arranging a profusion of plants with white, pink, yellow, and vermilion red flowers. Here you are. I know this is hardly what one might call a likeness, but for me it renders the poetic character and the style of the garden as I feel it. All the same, let us suppose that the two ladies out for a walk are you and our mother. Let us even suppose that there is not the least, absolutely not the least vulgar and fatuous resemblance, yet the deliberate choice of color, the somber violet with the blotch of violet citron yellow of the dahlias suggests mother's personality to me. The figure of the scotch plaid with orange and green checks stands out against the somber green of the cypresses, which contrast is further accentuated by the red parasol. This figure gives me an impression of you, like those in Dickens' novels, a vaguely representative figure. I don't know whether you can understand that one may make a poem only by arranging colors in the same way that you can say comforting things in music. One night I went for a walk by the sea along the empty shore. It was not gay, but neither was it sad. It was beautiful. The deep Blue sky was flicked with clouds of a blue deeper than the fundamental blue of intense cobalt and others of a clearer blue, like the blue whiteness of the Milky Way. On the blue depth, the stars were sparkling, greenish, yellow, white, rose, brighter, flashing more like jewels than they do even in Paris. The sea was a very deep ultramarine blue. At present, I absolutely want to paint a starry sky. It often seems to me that night is still more richly colored than the day, having hues of the most intense violets, blues, greens. If only you pay attention to it, you will see that certain stars are citron yellow, others have a pink glow or a green blue and forget-me-not brilliance. And without my explaining, it will be clear that Putting little white dots on a blue-black surface is not enough 